Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, welcome to our evening worship service. Welcome to those online and joining in. Uh, it's good that you can tune in. Uh, it's, uh, it's good, isn't it, that we can gather and that we can worship our triune God. Uh, we can do it two times on a Sunday. What a privilege that is. Uh, we come and we can hear God's word read. We can sing hymns of praise and we can hear God's Word preached, and that's what's going to happen uh, this evening. Just a, a notice, uh, I've just been handed it. If anyone would like to bring one or two items, this is for the, um, uh, the shoebox appeal. If anyone would like to bring one or two items, there's a bin at the entrance. Now, I presume there'll be, it'll be clear which bin it is that you put it in, and it's not the usual bin that we put rubbish in. So just, But there should be a bin. So if you want you know, one or two items that you're thinking of perhaps putting into the, the shoeboxes, then there'll be a, a clearly marked bin at the entrance. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, please do that if you can. Should we uh, start by praying? Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to come and worship you together, to gather again as a church. Uh, we, we thank you that we can do that because of Christ. We thank you that we can gather now and, and we can worship you freely in this country. Lord, we, we take that for granted. In other countries, there are, it's, it's, it's illegal to come and gather together, Lord. So we thank you that we have such freedoms in this country. But Lord, we thank you that we can do so because Christ has died for our sins. And, and that makes all the difference. And he's risen from the grave, which means we come to a living God, a, a God that saves, a God of the resurrection, a God that brings eternal life. And so we want to offer you all praise and glory and honor this evening. You are God that, uh, who is almighty, that is all-powerful, that is sovereign, and, 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 and does not have to uh, uh, come into this world, does not have to deal with the problems of this world, and yet you did through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord. You, you dealt with that sin problem once and for all at the cross, and so we thank you for that. And we come again uh, after uh, perhaps a, an afternoon of, of relaxing, perhaps an afternoon of doing various jobs, an afternoon of stress, Lord, whatever uh, um, mindset that you find us in and heart uh, that, you, uh, that we, we're coming this evening, that you would deal with us by your word and by your spirit, that you would be working in us by your word and by your spirit. And Lord, we come and, and, and confess our sins again, knowing that uh, the blood of Jesus wipes away every sin, and we thank you uh, for that reality, Lord. So we, we come uh, with expectant hearts, Lord. Give us expectant hearts. Give us clarity of mind and heart to listen to you this evening. Lord, would you thrill us with your word? Would you thrill us with the truths of your word? And would you help us to fix our eyes more and more upon Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith? In his precious name we pray. Amen. So we're continuing our series in Genesis uh, and we've, we've got to the part in Genesis, which is the flood story. And we, we ummed and ahed, should we read the, the whole flood story? And we, we are pretty much, we're going to do, Ian will be looking this evening at chapter 6, 7, and 8, and then next week we'll be looking at chapter, chapter 9 together. Uh, when, so we thought we'd, we'd read most of it. Uh, and uh, for a little bit of variety, we've got two readers uh, Matt's going to come and start reading from verse 11 of chapter 6, and then Ian will read chapter 7, and then Matt will come up again and read chapter 8. So if you've got your Bibles, please have them, uh, and we're going to read God's Word together now. Where's Matt? <laughs> Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I am going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. 
Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide and 30 cubits high. Make a roof for it, leaving below the roof an opening one cubit high all around. Put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle and upper decks. I am going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has the breath of life in it, everything on earth will perish. But I will establish my covenant with you and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, and of every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it away as food for you and for them. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. The Lord then said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of every kind of clean animal, and a male and its mate, and one pair of every kind of unclean animal, a male and its mate, and also seven pairs of every kind of bird, male and female, to keep their various kinds alive throughout the earth. Seven days from now I will send rain on the earth for forty days and forty nights, and I will wipe from the face of the earth every living creature I've made. And Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. Noah was six hundred years old when the flood waters came on the earth, and Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives entered the ark to escape the waters of the flood. Pairs of clean and unclean animals, of birds and of all creatures that move along the ground, male and female, came to Noah and entered the ark as God had commanded Noah. And after the seven days, the flood waters came on the earth. In the six hundredth year of Noah's life, on the seventeenth day of the second month, on that day all the springs of the great deep burst forth, and the floodgates of the heavens were opened, and, the, and rain fell on the earth for forty days and forty nights. On that very day Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, uh, together with his wife and the wives of his three sons, entered the ark, they had with them every wild animal according to its kind, all livestock according to their kinds, every creature that moves along the ground according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, everything with wings, pairs of all creatures that have the breath of life in them, came to Noah and entered the ark. The animals going in were male and female of every living thing, as God had commanded Noah, then the Lord shut him, hit, him in. For forty days the flood came, kept coming on the earth, and as the waters increased, they lifted the ark high above the earth. The waters rose and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. They rose greatly on the earth, and all the mountains under the entire heavens were covered. The waters rose and covered the mountains to a depth of more than fifteen cubits. Every living thing that moved on land perished. Birds, livestock, wild animals, all the creatures that swarm over the earth, and all mankind, everything on dry land, that had the breath of life in its nostrils, um, died. Every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. 
people and animals and the creatures that move along the ground and the birds were wiped from the earth. Only Noah was left and those with him in the ark. The waters flooded the earth for a hundred and fifty days. But God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark. And he sent a wind over the earth and the waters receded. Now the springs of the deep and the floodgates of the heavens had been closed and the rain had stopped falling from the sky. The water receded steadily from the earth. At the end of the 150 days, the water had gone down. And on the 17th day of the seventh month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. The waters continued to recede until the 10th month. And on the first day of the 10th month, the tops of the mountains became visible. After 40 days, Noah opened a window he had made in the ark and sent out a raven. And it kept flying back and forth until the water dried up from the earth. Then he sent out a dove to see if the water had receded from the surface of the ground. But the dove could find nowhere to perch because there was water over all the surface of the earth. So it returned to Noah in the ark. He reached out his hand and took the dove and brought it back to himself in the ark. He waited seven more days and again sent out the dove from the ark. When the dove returned to him in the evening, there in its beak was a freshly plucked olive leaf. Then Noah knew that the water had receded from the earth. He waited seven more days and sent the dove out again, but this time it did not return to him. By the first day of the first month of Noah's 601st year, the water had dried up from the earth. Noah then removed the covering from the ark and saw that the surface of the ground was dry. By the 27th day of the second month, the earth was completely dry. Then God said to Noah, Come out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. Bring out every kind of living creature that is with you, the birds, the animals, and all the creatures that move along the ground, so they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in number on it. So Noah came out together with his sons and his wife and his sons' wives, all the animals and all the creatures that move along the ground and all the birds, everything that moves on land came out of the ark one kind after another. I wish I'd seen that. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, Never again will I curse the ground because of humans. Even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood, and never again Will I destroy all living creatures as I have done? As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, will never cease. Thank you. Before Ian comes and preaches and brings God's word to us, we're going to sing a, a, a song, a song that I think we should sing as a prayer uh, to get us into the right frame of mind. O breath of God, come fill this place. Let's stand and sing together.
wonder sometimes if, um, if all your sermon went down the back and you couldn't get it, and you thought, well, what would you do then? I'd have to do it from memory, wouldn't I? Anyway. Uh, shall we just uh, have a word of prayer together? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful privilege of being together and for a few minutes to look at your word together. And we pray for the help of your Holy Spirit. Open our eyes that we may see wonderful things from your word. In Jesus' name, Amen. Why don't you imagine with me that you come along to the service or any meeting in here, and you come in and you think, ah, you sort of sniff, and you think, hmm, smell too good in here, uh, some unsavoury smells. Anyway, you sit down and the meeting takes place and you get used to the smell. By the end of the meeting, you just don't notice the uh, smell anymore. And so you go home, Next week you come again and uh, hmm, there's still that smell around the place and you think, hmm. anyway, sit down, go through the motions of the meeting again and of course you get used to, used to the smell. And so the next week you come down and Jonathan Mason comes to you and says, come and have a look down here, takes you down to the uh, sort of Takes you down. <laughs> You're the worst nightmare. This is going to be. Um, you go down to. Just go down to the kitchen. And you just notice some brown stuff seeping into the kitchen. Doesn't look too good. This. And he takes you down to the the lounge. And it's whoa! It's getting pretty thick. Whatever this particularly smelly, unpleasant stuff is. And you go down to the the lower hall and you'd have to wade through it. And you realize that, that there's, there's sewage, raw sewage coming into the building and it's gradually building up. And this is awful. And you say, we've got to do something about this. You can't just put up with that little smell that we come have in this meeting. Before long, it's going to be swamping the whole building and we're going to be contaminated and imagine the disease and the effect upon uh, each of us, not just the smell, but just the possible harmful consequences. Now, it's not a very nice image, is it, that I've conjured up in your mind, but it's something of that image that I want us to realize as we look at the first part of um, Genesis chapter 6, we're looking at something extremely unpleasant. It's worse than the cesspit of sewage coming to a building. This is the, the cesspit of sin that God sees. Because I'm sure you've, we've, we've all heard the story of Noah and the flood. It's a children's story relayed at school or at Sunday school. And we're so familiar with it. So I want us just to look at the, the sin, the darkness, and why. Why the flood? Why destroy every animal, every person on the planet, apart from this one family and the animals in the ark? Why? Sure, we, we're horrified if we think about this, that there's a worldwide flood that destroys everything. So we're going to think about that, and then we'll, in the second part, there's only two points, <laughs> there's seven sheets, but two points, uh, the, the darkness, but then there's a light shining in this darkness, and that's Noah and God saving Noah. We're going to think about what that teaches us. So, first of all, the wickedness in the world, as it's entitled in, uh, in the Bible. So, if you could have your Bible open, it would be helpful. And God's... When he created the, the world, 
and he'd finished creating on, uh, on, at the beginning, he looks out upon the world, and what does he say? He says it's very good. Oh, it's the beauty, the uh, variety, the uh, loveliness of creation. It's very good. But now, uh, several hundred years have gone by. You, you remember that the Adam and Eve, they uh, rebelled against God. It might have seemed like just a simple act, but it was a, an act of rebellion, of eating of that fruit. They saw the fruit, they saw it was lovely, and they took it, and in that act of eating the fruit, they were, in a sense, saying, my views are more important than God's. I'm the boss of my heart. It was an act of treason. God sh should be the, the king of our hearts. And in that act of eating the apple, they, they took God off their throne and put themselves on the throne. And as we, we learnt last week, uh, that this didn't just stay in the garden. It, 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 it multiplied this the, the sin and the rebellion against God. And so we've got people living contrary to how God wants us to live. He wants us to live in harmony. And there's the first murder. And as time goes on, you've got the boasting of Lamech uh, and how he boasts in what he can do in his violent character and how this, is, this sin is increasing. Now we get to chapter 6 in uh, Genesis and we see in verse 5 that God does not say the world is very good. What does he say? He says, the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. It's as if he's saying, this is very bad. Gone from being very good to being very bad. And so, as the population multiplies, so th sin multiplies. Now, I have a confession to make. If you look at what's happening at the beginning of this chapter, uh, it talks about the sons of uh, God and the daughters of men or humans. So it says, when human beings began to increase in the number of the, on earth and the daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw the daughters of humans, that they were beautiful, and they married any of them they chose. And God sees this, whatever it is that's happening, and he says, My spirit will not contend with humans forever, for they are mortal. Their days will be uh, 120 years. Tick, 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 tick. It's a, it's a time bomb starting there. It's as if God's saying, This awfulness, whatever it is, this sinfulness, this blackness, it's only going to go on for a period of time, and then it's going to end, 120 years. And it talks about the uh, sons of um, God uh, looking at the daughters of humans and marrying any of them that they chose. It has a kind of echo of Adam and Eve in the garden. They saw... They saw that it was lovely, it was beautiful, and they took it. And it's as if the, these sons of God are looking and seeing these w women and, and making a judgment on, on the attractiveness and taking for themselves and, and not regarding God's law in this. And the suggestion is taking more, more than one wife here. As we go on further, verse 4, it says, The Nephilim were in, on the earth uh, in these days, in those days, and also afterwards. And when the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them, they were the heroes of old, men of renown. 
then the Lord saw the great wickedness of the human race. So, what's going on here? The sons of God and the daughters of men. Now, I confess, I don't know. I don't really understand. There seems to be three possibilities. Are you welcome to read up on them and, and decide which fits both, best for you? But they may be angelic build, uh, beings. Some people have suggested they're angelic beings uh, who come and um, marry human women and produce a, some kind of hybrid child. Some have suggested that these are um, kings who, who claim divine descent. Others have suggested that these are humans building a kingdom for themselves, becoming famous through their might and through their power. Whichever it is, God is not pleased. Um, there they, they seems to be um, behavior that is contrary to what God has said. And what does God decide to do about it? Will he put up with it? No, we've read in verse 3, the Lord said, my spirit will not contend with humans forever, for they are mortal, their days will be 120 years. What else does the Lord see? Well, he, he sees, in, uh, sees not just the outward behavior, he sees the heart. He sees the heart. Did you notice that as we read that verse? He says uh, in verse 5, he says, How great the wickedness of human race has become on earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart were only evil all the time. As God looks out upon earth and uh, mankind. He sees the heart. He sees right into the heart. He sees into our hearts this evening. He, 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 he can see our thought processes. He, he knows our plans. He knows what we're purposing. He knows, uh, he knows that even the best of deeds that we come up with, the best of plans that we come up with, they're all tainted with sin. Our reasoning, our emotions, if, if our motives are not um, prompted by God, if God's not the motivating factor, then, then we're, we, 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 um, we become self-centered, we become self-interested, we become self-pleasing. And God doesn't just see the sin and it, it, its effects. Do you notice? It's not just that he sees sin. He actually, see, uh, he actually feels, he responds to it. Look at verse 6. Um, the Lord regretted that he had made human beings on earth and his heart was deeply troubled. Can you imagine a, a, a worse thing, really? Here's God looking upon his creation and regretting that he'd made human beings and that his heart was deeply troubled. I think this, this reminds us that God isn't distant. He's not up there, away from everything. He's right down here, experiencing, seeing what's happening. And he's not a, a God that doesn't care. He really does care. When he sees humans ruining the world and each other, he's, he's broken within. There's a grief. He's deeply troubled. It's, it's an emotional pain. It's a pain, it's the same kind of pain. When you look at the use of this word, it's the same kind of pain that, that someone experiences when they lose a loved one. Or, or, or you lose someone very precious to you. It's the, it's the pain that comes from that. You know, when we, when we enter into a close relationship with someone, we, 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 we open up our hearts to them. 
and we open up our, ourselves to being hurt, don't we? The closer we are to someone, if that relationship's broken, the greater the pain. And so, I don't think there's anybody in this room that can't identify with what, what God feels. Surely you, many of us, have known the, the, the pain of a broken relationship. Or many of us have known the pain, uh, seen the pain in somebody else where there's broken relationships. We, we know what this is like. And yet this isn't, that isn't as deep, this is deeper than that. This is the relationship of a God who comes and creates a world and creates humans in his, in his own hip image, who gets his hands dirty, as it were, and, and forms a human being re to reflect his glory and to reflect his likeness, to, to show the loveliness of God. What an what a, what a individual, what a, a thing that... God has made, what a person God has made, and how he's involved in, in creating men and women who should reflect his image. And here they are. Everything about them is characterized and tainted by sin. It's, it's a ruin. It's, it's a disgrace. Something that should be lovely is now ugly and horrible. And can we begin to begin to realize why God comes to this conclusion? There, there's people ruining themselves and ruining others and ruining creation by, by their sinful, selfish actions and thoughts and deeds and words. And he can see, God can see that if he just leaves creation to itself, it's going to headlong into destruction. It's going to destroy itself. And so he sets this ticking clock, ticking bomb. There's only going to be so much more, and then it's going to be an end to this. I'm going to judge the world. Sin must be judged. It cannot continue causing rack and ruin. God passionately wants to protect the goodness of his world and so he determines to, to clean it, to wipe it clean, to wash it clean of humanity's evil. See, God has the right to destroy the world that he's breathed life into. God is the one who gave life to us and gives life. He has every right to take life. I know it's terrible, it's awful, isn't it? But this is a result of human sin. He purposes to do so before this wickedness gets any further. And so the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I've created, and with them the animals, the birds, the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. Notice the animals are affected by man's sin. Our sin doesn't just contaminate us, it, it pollutes the, the rest of the world that we live in. It infects it sticks to us. It, it's a stench that fills the world, the sin of sin. So God is sorry, he groans and grieves, and he groans with pain. It's the darkness. If I, I thought, well, maybe we could put Bible verses up on the board here, uh, this chapter, and you put black over all the, the sin, there'd be some verses that would be bright and stand out and shine. And those are the verses that we come to now. Because God looks out on the world and he's, he's, he's said he will do, judge the world with, and uh, wipe it clean with, with a, a flood. But he also, he won't do that until he's made provision for one man and his family. 
and for the animals as well, the land animals. And we read this, he says in verse 8, But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Whoa, the light's shining now. And we read, we read in verse uh, 9, the, this is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Shem Ham, and Japheth. And then we get back to a description of the, the blackness. The earth was uh, corrupt in God's sight and full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people, uh, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. So we, we've got this blackness at the first part of the chapter, and then we've got this bit about uh, Noah and his, his family, and then we've got blackness again. And... This is the light shining, isn't it, in the dark? He's described as uh, find, finding favor in the eyes of the Lord. This word favor is the, the same word grace. It, it's, it's, he's someone who has experienced the kindness of God in his life. And this makes a different to, difference to how he lives. He, he's, he's described as having found favour. The suggestion is not that he's earned anything. This is, this is something that's undeserved and that he's, he, he's got because it's a gift to him. And because he's found favour, we see that it affects how he lives. It's described, Noah was a righteous man. As people looked at Noah, they saw someone who was trying to order his life in a, in a, in a upright, moral way, in a, in, a, in a way that God approved of. He orders his life in a, in a, in a way that, that's not taking, it's, it's a life that's giving. It's not a life that is self-centered, but a life that is God-orientated and other-orientated. They begin to see something of the righteous, he, that he was blameless. And that doesn't say that he didn't do anything wrong at all, but the, the orientation of his life was in the, in the direction of, of living in a way that helped and showed love to others, rather than taking his giving. And we have this lovely phrase, which we've come across before, and he walked faithfully, with God. Remember Enoch that we thought about last week. Here's another man who walks with God. He's got a, a relationship with God. He speaks to God. He, he's living his life in the awareness of that God is, and God is his creator, and God is, is his Lord. So he, here's one who, who is is a, a righteous, blameless man who walks with God. What's the difference between someone who faithfully walks with God and someone who doesn't? Somebody who walks alone in this life, they wake up at night a bit restless, all, all kinds of things going through their mind. And they struggle on and eventually go back to sleep. And then there's a person who walks with God. They wake up, got lots of things going on in the mind. And they just think, thank you, Lord. Thank you, you're with me. And they go back to sleep. Or maybe not. But the person who has a walk with God has a consciousness that God is there with them in whatever they're going through and whatever they're doing. 
every action, every thought is in the awareness that God is there and with them. And so, Noah, he shines in God's eyes. And he's a testimony to the fact that it's possible to live a godly life in a, an exceedingly bad world. You can be surrounded by sin and the awfulness of selfishness and living for today and living for ourselves, the world that's preoccupied. It's possible to be in a world that's preoccupied with self and ruining itself and live a godly life, as is testimony by, testified by Noah. So what does God see? There's this black backdrop. And in the midst of it, there's one who shines out. Corruption, separation, hurt, closeness with God in Noah's life, caring, giving, uh, building, building for others, doing for others. Worshipping God, loving God. What an amazing thing to be presented with as we, we think about these, this chapter. Now you're probably thinking, I haven't even got through chapter 6 yet. <clears throat> and this is looking exceedingly worrying, isn't it? As we've got another two and a half chapters to go. So please do not panic. Our second part is going to be much quicker. And is, we're focusing on how God saves. So, God is a God who judges. That's point one. And you can see why. The awfulness and the terrible state of sin and how it's dominating and eventually going to ruin and destroy everything. And so, he's going to... Uh, destroy the world through the flood. So God is a God who judges, and he judges sin. But here we learn that God is a God who rescues. And we see it in Noah and his family and in, within the ark. And then I'm going to quickly remind you of some fascinating things about how God saved Noah and his family. So first of all, there's only four, very quickly. One, it was God's plan from the beginning to end. God told Noah what to do, and Noah did. He obeyed. God told him that he was going to put an end to the world, except for Noah and his family. And he told Noah what to do, and he gave him the instructions to make an ark. And Noah built the ark according to God's design. The specifications were God's. It was God's method. It wasn't Noah's method, not Noah's idea. Noah didn't know what a flood was. It, Noah may not have even seen rain. And so he had God's word. God told him what was, he was going to do. And he had to provide, build this ark, which would save him and his family and the, the animals that were to come in. There's a judgment coming. The next judgment that's coming, there's only two judgments, isn't there? Well, there's three in a sense, but there's the next judgment that's coming won't be with water, it will be with fire. And it will be the judgment that our generation is accelerating towards. And there's only one way to be saved, and it's God's way. And if you have been coming to this church for some time, you'll know that the only way that we can be saved is through Jesus. Jesus is the way. No one comes to the Father except through me, he says. So secondly, God is in control. It's God's timing. God says in verse 1 of chapter 7, go into the ark. He tells them when they're to go in. Uh, he also uh, influences somehow how uh, the, the animals come along. The, the animals 
come to Noah and enter the ark. It's God who says, come out, in 8.15. It's God who shuts them in the ark. He, God who closes the door. Noah does everything else, getting everything else ready, the food and getting the animals into the ark after having built the ark for uh, or n near enough 100 years. But God closes the door. I just want to think, what's, what's this telling us? Uh, when you fly, when you go on a flight, so if you've flown, you see those doors, they have to be really quite thick and sort of, they have to stop the pressure changes, don't they? Uh, and it always worries me a little bit. They're <laughs> closing it and then closing the door. Have they done it properly? Imagine a little child doing it and you think, well, I don't think they've closed it properly. I'm going to go and check it or ask somebody else to check it. Or you think of these, the ferries with with the, the gate, the, the, the front pit that has to come up and seal. And I think Matt reminded me that there was a ferry disaster, wasn't it? The, 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 the door wasn't closed properly and the ferry uh, sank. There's no danger of this. Yes, Noah built the ark, but God closed the door. I think it really... It speaks to me that there's security in God's method. We might try to get to heaven or avoid judgment in our own ways, but that's foolishness. It's like leaving the door open. We need to have God close us in and, and bring us through um, the judgment to come. Notice in verse eight, uh, verse one of verse eight, uh, chapter eight, it says, "But God remembered Noah." Oh, I was, yeah. Shall I? No, I, I will do it anyway. Uh, uh, all the numbers. If you highlight the numbers in this chapter, you start with seven at the beginning and seven at the end, and then there's another seven, and there's another seven, and then there's. 40 days and 40 nights, and there's another 40 days and 40 nights towards the end. And then you've got 150 days, and then 150 days. And then here, you've got the Lord remembered Noah. Obviously, coming up to the climax, it follows the, the trajectory of the water. The, going up to here, and then at the top, when the water is triumphant over the whole of the world, it's, it's accomplished everything God sent it to do. Uh, God remembered Noah. And it's not just that he, he, he forgot and then he remembered. This, this remembering in the Bible is more than just bringing to mind. It's bringing to mind and doing something in, what, in the light of what you know. Just as um, when... The, the thief on the cross, or the, the criminal on the cross next to Jesus said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He's not just saying, remember me. Oh, I remember that, that man who was on the cross. No, remember me in such a way that, as to bring me into that kingdom with you. So it, there's an act, activity with this remembering. And it's the same here. God does something. God causes the waters to recede. God also gives those token, uh, the, some encouragements with the, do, uh, the raven and the dove, or at least with the dove. There's an encouragement. Imagine all those days in that ark for, for over a year. I can't imagine what it would be like for 40 days and 40 nights with the rain pelting down. I know it's bad in Yorkshire at times, but even to be in a caravan where it's raining day and night, day and night, just for two days, and then maybe going to three days, oh no, not rain again. And imagine being in the ark, and it's 40 days and 40 nights with the rain. And then there's, a, there's the calm, as the waters are still rising uh, to, to flood the, the world. 
150 days. 150 days in the heart. I think Noah and his wife. We've been now 50 days marking up on the on the, the in the wood. Uh, 60 days, 70 days. Maybe today, 150. And then even then, there's the uh, the 40 days, 40 nights. And then even then, after that, there's another uh, seven days. What's the point? What, what point are we making for this? Is that uh, it, it's God who tells no what to do. It's God who's in control. And Noah had to have exceedingly great patience, didn't he? God has great patience, but so did Noah. And Noah had faith. That's our third ingredient. So faith is necessary. Noah obeyed. What? What? hundred years before the, he, he finished building the, the ark, he starts building it. Why does he start building the ark and spending all those years building the ark? Because God told him to. We're not told whether, not told whether God says anything in, in the intervening time to, to uh, Noah. It could be years that he's... But did you really hear God say, build an ark? Did God really say that he was going to destroy uh, the world with a flood? A flood? What's a flood? There's no water around here uh, that, that would flood anybody. Imagine the, the people passing by. There's Noah, year after year, building this ark, this, this floating structure. He's, he's crazy. This is ludicrous. What's he, what's he up to? No, Noah carries on. Noah believes God. And on the basis of God's word, he does what God asks him to do. And so he builds the ark. Imagine, if God had ignored God's word, if Noah had ignored God's word, then none of them would have been saved. There'd be no ark. There would be none of us. If God had not, if Noah had ignored, if Noah hadn't believed, and hadn't trusted God's word. So, Noah is a, is a man of faith. This is what faith is. Faith, faith is, is taking God at his word. God has said things, and because God has said them, I, I, I believe them, I, I trust them, I act upon them. What, what, is, what has God said to us? Let's, let's think for a moment what's God said. He said, he said, I've given my one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him, in Jesus, shall not perish, but have eternal life. God has said that. Now it might seem ludicrous. Put my trust in somebody who lived over uh, 2,000 years ago. Put my trust in somebody who uh, professed to be God and man. Put my trust in somebody who humbled himself and became like a man and became a servant and went to die on a cross for others. Put my trust in him. That seems crazy. But no, God has told us this. Yes, there's a judgment on its way and God has told us this is the way that we are kept safe. This is the way we're saved. And we either are a people of faith or we're not. If we're people of faith, then we'll rest our, our souls in Jesus Christ and trust in him. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Anyone who cries out, Lord, save me. I need you, Lord. I can't save myself. Do we trust it or not? It's, it's standing on every promise of God's word. That's what Noah uh, was doing. And that's what he did. Fourthly, the whole thing is a recreation, isn't it? God has set the, the reset button. He's pressed the reset button. He started everything again. Remember, we started off with water. 
and God bringing land out of water and making a place for man, humans, men and women to live and providing for them on land. Now, the land is a, is a watery ball in, in, this, in this chapter. And when we get to that, the Lord remembered Noah, the water starts subsiding, the land's coming out. And then we have uh, the, uh, the ark and, and, and Noah and his family coming out and God saying to them, go, go out and multiply. Exactly the same as what he said to uh, Adam and Eve uh, at the beginning. This is a new creation. God, God has, has produced a, a new heavens and a new earth. And um, he, he's, he started it all again. But did this sort out sin? Did it sort out sin? It didn't, did it? Look at 8, verse 21. As you can see, we're almost near to the end of that. Um, verse 21. The Lord smelled a pleasing aroma. This is the sacrifice that Noah had made at the end. When he came out, he sacrificed to the Lord. And the Lord said in his heart, Never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. There's a hint, isn't there, there? It's going to be the same old thing again. The hearts, sinning hearts, are going to spoil the world again. But the next judgment with fire, on the other side of that, there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth wherein righteousness dwells. It's going to be completely fixed. It's right. It's going to be unspoiled and unable to be spoiled. That's amazing, isn't it? Amazing. So, God judges Sin. He must, because of the awfulness of sin. And God is a God who saves and rescues. And the lesson from this is, it's still true today how we're saved. It says, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this new heavens, new earth, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Are you at peace with God? Are you ready for the judgment to come? Do you know that you'll be safe? As, as the world goes through the, the judgment, we will all be judged on that day of judgment. Are you at peace? And the only way that you can be at peace is to be in Christ, trusting in his word, trusting in his promises, trusting in his work on your behalf. That's the ark for us. And are you in that ark? And this, these three chapters, and a little bit extra, they, they show us that God is able to judge the unrighteous, and God knows exactly how to rescue the godly. So may we be bright, shining lights like Noah, people of faith, trusting in Christ, and ready for that great and awful day. Amen. Thank you, Ian. In response to God's word, we're going to come in praise. We're going to sing a couple of songs in praise, singing our praise to God. I have a shelter in the storm, and then great is the gospel of our glorious God.
Let's uh, sing together. judgment and yet in this judgment we see a rescue let's sing great is the gospel of our glorious god
Let me end in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you are a God that is holy and just and a God that uh, cannot accept sin to reign, sin to be that, 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 that horrible stench that, that covers the earth. And so we thank you that you are a God that judges and yet a God in judgment who saves, a God who rescues. And we thank you that we see that salvation and that rescue supremely in Christ who has judged on our behalf for our sins as our Savior. And we want to uh, seek him now, Lord. We cry out and ask you to help us to, to turn to him and to trust in him by faith now and to keep walking with him, we pray. And as we pray this to the King of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen.